live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. After a game ends, following a 15-minute cooldown period where the coach gets to talk to his team, and where the players get to have some time to readjust their minds now that the game is over, reporters enter the locker room and get to talk to the players, asking them questions about what went right, or in the case of the losing team, what went wrong. Most of the time after a loss, the players don't really want to speak. They kind of have to do that so that they don't get fined, but the players are upset and don't really want to say anything, because they're still processing how a week's worth of work just slipped down the drain. And that especially goes for a game decided on the final play. But 99.9% .9 of the time, because the players are professionals, they'll answer questions, even if the answers that they give are pretty vanilla. This incident is not one of those times. Because in 2000, the Cincinnati Bengals verbally beat up a reporter so badly after a loss that the reporter left the locker room. And the reporter didn't even ask any question or say anything provocative. This reporter literally didn't even do anything. The reason why the Bengals players were united against this reporter in particular in their mission to keep him out is one of the most frustrating and infuriating things you're ever going to hear. And it's a prime example of how not to handle a complicated and difficult situation like this one, where it's bad news on top of bad news. This is the story behind one of the craziest locker room incidents in the history of the Cincinnati Bengals. Before I talk about why the reporter was kicked out of the locker room, basically being forced out against his will, we need some context to understand the landscape of the Bengals, as well as what happened during this game before the reporter tried to enter. It's November 19th, 2000, and it's week 12 of the NFL season, and we have a battle at Foxborough Stadium on our hands between the New England Patriots and the Cincinnati Bengals. This game was absolutely critical if you had $10,000 or more riding on it. For everyone else, not so much. Of all the games on the schedule, this was definitely one of them. Scratch that. On paper, it might have been the worst, least appealing game of the season. Entering this game, the Patriots and Bengals were two of the worst teams in football, with both of them sitting at 2-8, and eight, practically eliminated from the playoff picture. And it's not like you even had the toilet bowl battle for the first pick thing attached to it, because the San Diego Chargers had that all but wrapped up at 0-10. So this was just your generic game between two awful teams, with nothing to play for. For Cincinnati, just like practically every season so far in the 1990s during the Bungles era, this was a season that had gone off the rails. Through 10 games, they had scored 93 points, for an abysmal average of 9.3 points per game, which was easily the worst total in the league. Their point differential of minus 124 was the worst in the league. They were averaging under 108 passing yards per game, and they had two passing touchdowns all season. That was it. For some perspective, in week two of that 2000 season, Jaguars wide receiver Jimmy Smith had more receiving touchdowns by himself in one game against the Baltimore Ravens than every Bengals player had through 10 games combined. It was that bad. As a side note, if you want to learn more about that historic performance by Smith, click the card in the upper right corner. And just like practically every other game so far in 2000 where Corey Dillon wasn't the greatest running back ever assembled, this game was not a pretty sight, and was an ugly offensive display for the Bengals. This was a game of blown opportunities. The Patriots scored a touchdown in the first quarter after getting great field position following a Brandon Bennett fumble well within their own territory. Neil Rackers missed a chip shot field goal from 30 yards out. The Bengals committed not one, but two false start penalties in the fourth quarter on the final two drives, backing them up and killing any offensive momentum that they might have had and that they desperately needed. Corey Dillon, one of the best halfbacks in football, had just 2.8 yards per carry and didn't have a single run go for 10 yards or more, as the offensive line couldn't give him anything. Not one, but two receivers on the Patriots went for over 100 yards, with Troy Brown having 110 yards and Terry Glenn having 129 yards with both receivers having a field day on the outside. And on New England's final drive of the game, the Bengals allowed two critical third downs, including one that all but ended the game by putting the Pats on the one-yard line following a defensive pass interference penalty on Rodney Heath. On the final play from scrimmage, with the score tied at 13 apiece, Adam Vinatieri drilled a chip shot 22-yard field goal to win the game for the Pats 16-13. 
This was the biggest kick of Adam Vinatieri's career in a game that took place at Foxborough Stadium against an AFC team with a score tied at 13 apiece. The loss brought the Bengals to 2-9, clinching the team's fourth straight losing season, and continuing a downward spiral that began after Bruce Coslett's departure following an 0-3 start and never recovered. But we're not really here to talk about the game. Again, the game was completely meaningless, although the loss meant that the Bengals players were not in a good mood whatsoever. It's what happened after the game that's the real drama of the story. Because after the game, reporter George Vogel entered the locker room, trying to get some interviews and sound bites for the TV station that he worked for, WLWT. And when he tried to do this, the Bengals players weren't having any of it, and threatened Vogel, forcing him to get out of the locker room and never return. Defensive tackle Oliver Gibson was the first one to spot Vogel, and he said, Get the expletive out of here. I guarantee you, nobody's going to talk to you. Gibson then raised his voice, and other players joined in on trying to attack Vogel. Quarterback Achilles Smith, among other players, were yelling at Vogel and demanding that Jack Brennan, the public relations director for the team, eject him. Linebacker Takeo Spike said that he never wanted to see Vogel again, and said on the station, They're frozen out completely. They'll never get another word from me. Upon receiving this backlash, and upon being singled out by all the Bengals players with this being an insanely toxic and hostile environment, Vogel and his cameraman voluntarily left the locker room. He tried playing the high road at first, not wanting to make himself a part of the story, and when he returned to his boss, said that nothing happened. However, other reporters were in the locker room and saw what happened, so the story got out that the players were trying to fight Vogel. And once the story got out, Vogel decided to speak, saying, I always thought Oliver Gibson was a stand-up guy. Not anymore. He wanted a scrum. I'm afraid that's a battle I would have lost. That raises the ultimate question. Why did the Bengals players do this? Why did they verbally harass a reporter until he left? And why did the team want to fight him? Well, prepare yourselves for something that's about to make your blood boil. Because as it turns out, Vogel worked for a company that had the audacity to... Get ready for this. Report the news. The man you're watching right now is Tremaine Mack. He was drafted by the Cincinnati Bengals in the fourth round of the 1997 NFL Draft. And by 1998, he was returning kicks regularly for the team. And by the end of the 1990s, Mack was one of the best kick returners in all of football. There were very few bright spots on those Bengals teams from the late 90s, because for the most part, Watching the Bengals in the late 90s was a form of human torture, as there was a reason that they were called the Bungles. However, Mack was one of the few good things, as he was an incredibly consistent and incredibly reliable kick returner for the team. In 1998, he averaged 25.9 yards per kick return, which ranked 7th in the NFL, and he followed that up in 1999 by averaging an incredible 27.1 yards per kick return, which was not only 3rd in the NFL behind Tony Horn of the St. Louis Rams, and Jason Tucker of the Dallas Cowboys, but was first in the entire AFC, and by a lot I might add. For some perspective, the next best kick returner in the AFC from a yards per return average that year was Brock Marion of the Miami Dolphins, and he averaged 24.6 yards per return. This meant that Mack was 2.5 yards per return better than the next best returner in the AFC. Again, he was that good, and for his efforts, he was named a Pro Bowler, being one of just two players on the Bengals to make the Pro Bowl that year, alongside Corey Dillon. That was the good news. The bad news was that he got into a lot of issues off the field. In November of 1997, he missed the entire month of November with a non-football injury. That injury? Well, it wasn't an injury. It was him serving a 30-day jail sentence for a DUI, where his blood alcohol content was .18, which was twice the legal limit in Ohio. He then had not one, but two DUI charges in 1998 in the state of Texas, and followed that up in October of 1998 by violating his probation by getting behind the wheel of a car, which got him behind bars again, and got him suspended for the final four games of 1998 by the NFL. So not that anyone should ever get behind the wheel drunk, and I have no respect whatsoever for those who do, but this wasn't exactly a man that made one terrible choice in judgment. This was a man who made many awful choices that could have gotten someone seriously killed or injured. Andrea Reckamp, 
the executive director of Southwest Ohio Mothers Against Drunk Driving, said on Mack and his driving history, Tremaine Mack falls into Mad's definition of a higher-risk driver. Those drivers are often overrepresented in DUI fatal crashes. Many of them escape detection until there is a crash and someone is injured or killed. Because of his actions, Mack's driving privileges were revoked until October of 2001. So what did Mack decide to do a few days before this game against the Patriots? You guessed it. Like a reckless moron with no regard for human life and willingness to accept the responsibility for his actions, Mack got behind the wheel, violating the terms of his probation. This was what felt like strike six or seven at this point. And the news station at Channel 5, WLWT, got it on camera. They caught Mack getting behind the wheel and driving when he was not supposed to. And it's not like the TV station was following Mac and setting up cameras undercover to try and catch him in the act. They caught him driving to and from practice. Presumably, the people working at WLWT were filming practice and saw Mac getting into and out of his car. So it's not like this was some secret spy mission. So what did the Bengals and the players decide to do about this? Again, here was a man who had more DUIs since being drafted by the Bengals than he had kick return touchdowns and was not only dumb enough to violate his probation multiple times, but was dumb enough to do this in the presence of a camera. And instead of punishing Mac, who wound up playing in that game against the Patriots, the players decided to attack the station and attack reporter George Vogel for entering the locker room, even though Vogel just worked for the company, and he wasn't even the one to report on the story. And Vogel said on the whole incident on how he was treated in the locker room, I'd seen other guys get it but in my 18 years here, I've never been remotely involved in anything close to this. I never anticipated raised voices. I was shocked. The players were defending a criminal who, quite frankly, should have been out of chances from a reporter who was an innocent bystander, had nothing whatsoever to do with this, and even if he did have something to do with this, was just doing his job. And Vogel didn't even ask a question about the incident or ask a question about anything at all. He just stood there but the players wanted him out. Oliver Gibson said, you come after one of us, we come after you. And linebacker Takeo Spike said, while defending Mac, if you want to follow somebody, go and follow a regular person. I'm sure if you pick a list of 10 people whose licenses are suspended, you could find them driving if you follow those 10 people around for however long they follow Tremaine around. Then don't come in the locker room and act like nothing ain't ever happened. Are you actually kidding me with that statement? This isn't a man who drove five over the speed limit. This is a man who had multiple DUIs and was violating his probation. They didn't follow him around in a helicopter pursuit or set up a decoy car to try and incentivize him to drive. He literally drove to and from practice where crews were already there. That's like me complaining that the cops arrested my friend who tried to rob a bank and went in through the front door. And of course when a player does it, there's a heightened scrutiny. That's the territory with being a local celebrity as an NFL player. You can't demand media attention when things go right and then refuse it when things go wrong. And then to have the audacity to blame the TV station for all of this and to blame the TV station for your teammates' actions is absolutely disgusting. Writer Tim Sullivan said it best, saying, It's one thing to support a friend in trouble. It's quite another thing to neglect or ignore criminal behavior because the criminal happens to excel at returning kickoffs. For what it's worth, Mack never played again after the 2000 season, and after the season, spent 30 days in jail for violating his probation. So what's the moral of the story? Don't get behind the wheel while intoxicated. Don't be dumb enough to violate your probation. Don't be dumb enough to throw away every chance that comes your way. And if you were going to be that stupid and reckless and careless, don't you dare blame a reporter who had nothing to do with it and who wasn't even there for when you did it and actually take some responsibility for your actions for once. The Bengals may have lost on the field that Sunday against the Patriots, but for many people, they lost more because they lost any sympathy and any respect that they had for that organization. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com. And be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. 
If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JaguarGator9. To see college football videos, subscribe to JaguarGator8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.